Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Western Heritage Center. My name is Kevin Cloyster, the executive director here. Uh, I love that we have all these fancy sound equipment in back there, and we're, we're back to our little uh, snub nose uh, amplifier here, which actually seems to work the best of everything we've had. So, uh, high noon lecture programs. Of course, we have Ellen today. I'll, I'll introduce her in a second. Uh, in two weeks, we have Jerry Ensler, who's traveling through the Northern Plains, and we happen to catch him on his book tour. He just produced a book uh, on Jim Bridger called Trailblazer of the American West. He's been working on it for 12 years, and it was just brought out by uh, University of Oklahoma Press uh, this past May. So if you miss him here, he'll be at Carbon County Historical Society the night before, on September 1st. If you want to travel all the way to Wyoming, the evening of September 2nd, after he spoke here at High Noon, uh, he'll be at the Sheridan Public Library. So, And then on September 16th, we have a Humanities Montana program, Mary Jane Bradbury, who many of you know as does actor portrayals, but she's not going to be acting this time. She's going to be herself and talk about the persistence of the women's rights movement. So uh, back to back, that should be awesome. We also have, obviously, our walking tours going on. Uh, we have a program in October called Voices of the Past, which will be the first time we're actually, uh, we'll be at the cemetery, but we have live actors playing the people in the graves. It's not gonna be a ghoulish thing. Nobody's gonna attack you from behind a grave or anything like that. Uh, we have to do it during the daytime. Also, the cemetery does allow evening events like that, which makes perfect sense in a dark cemetery. Uh, and so look for those programs. Those will be October 23rd and the 30th. It'll be Saturday morning program, so. Uh, without further ado, oh, I did want to mention also the Billings Youth Volunteers from the Moss Mansion and Western Heritage Center every year pick out their favorite artifacts. And they have put together this uh, small display on the left for, for us all to enjoy and stuff. So we love working with the kids. Uh, Lauren does a wonderful job working with uh, the Moss Mansion kids. and. Uh, kind of trade back and forth, squeeze them for all we can get, and they're usually really engaged, uh, talented young people who we get to work with. So uh, without further ado, Hel Ellen Baumler is the former interpretive historian. I had to rewrite this from your blog, you know. Uh, the former interpretive historian at Montana Historical Society. She received her PhD from the University of Kansas and worked at the Montana Historical Society for over 25 years. That's safe, right? What I uh, since retiring recently. Uh, she was born and raised in Missoula, did her graduate and undergraduate work at the University of Montana in the history program. Her writing includes, now from the blog it says seven, but she said 13 books and numerous uh, magazine articles. We have a couple of her books in our bookstore too, uh, more on the uh, time history in with these ghost tales in places like Virginia City, so it's a nice little angle to come in. But today she's gonna be talking about Life of the Afterlife in the Big Sky State, uh, which is a groundbreaking history of death in Montana, offers a unique, reflective, and sensitive uh, perspective on the evolution of customs and burial grounds. The book discusses cultural identity, evidence through burial practices, changing methods of internment, and why those came about, and the evolution of cemeteries as the last great necessity in organized communities. So she'll have a lot of examples and anecdotes. We have Lee Statmiller is actually one of our volunteers here, and uh, we got to know him from our walking tours through the Mountain View Cemetery. Lee is the recently retired cemetery manager, and uh, we did an oral history with him, and I think we went like three hours, because once he said he used to embalm bodies, we were like, tell us everything. <laughs> Uh, there's just this incredible, obviously we should have an incredible fascination with death. It's pretty much the other side of what we experience as life. So, uh, Ellen Bellmore, thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to deal with my stool here, uh, Kevin. Thank you for that introduction. I do have to say I wasn't born and raised in Missoula, though. I'm a Kansas girl. University of Kansas, fourth generation Jayhawk, so I just have to, uh, to bring that in. So uh, Montana has 1,700, at least 1,700 documented cemeteries. And that number doesn't include like forgotten uh, roadside burials, abandoned uh, places with family plots, 
uh, the remains of the, uh, the remains of people who thrived on the landscape, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. My aim here is to explore with you the very earliest burial customs. Um, consider a few individuals whose eternal sleep was rudely interrupted and explore the evolution of Montana's treatment and places of the dead. So it's pretty ambitious for 45 minutes and I'll try to get it all in there. So many of you, I'm sure, have read about the Anzic site and the Anzic child. That discovery was made in 1968 in Park County here in Montana and it has really had very far-reaching impacts, but my purpose is to emphasize its cultural significance as Montana's oldest known burial. Um, in the dim past when mammoths roamed Montana's hostile landscape, someone lay a, a small child to final rest, dusted him with red ochre, and placed precious heirlooms also covered in red ochre over him. Tucked into a rock shelter, he lay there undisturbed for probably more than 10,000 years. Ochre, for those of you that are not familiar with that, is a red mineral found in rocky outcrops. Archaeologists have um, recorded early burials saturated in ochre in the Baltic, in Europe, in Britain, in Spain, Israel, New Zealand, and myriad other places. Methods and meanings no doubt changed over time, over thousands of years, but in diverse examples of very early burial rites and beliefs, the color red and the use of ochre is often a common thread. Ochre is the main pigment in the earliest pictographs uh, elsewhere and also here in Montana. And most anthropologists today now agree that modern humans most likely entered the New World via the Bering Land Bridge at least 15,000 years ago and maybe earlier than that. Um, cultural practices came with these early people. The child's gravesite is uh, not only Montana's first known burial, but it is also the only Clovis period skeletal remains yet to be discovered in the entire New World. Clovis culture is among the earliest known in the Western Hemisphere. The first exquisite tools of these early people was discovered in 1932 in Clovis, New Mexico, hence the name Clovis. Their stone weapons have been found across the United States, but not with human remains. Only the Anzic site can make that claim. Fine Clovis spear points, like you see there, uh, indicate hunting prowess and the capability of bringing down very large prey, like mammoths. Clovis tools span a millennium and then disappear from the archaeological record. Theories for their disappearance um, include climatic changes that affected their food source or hunting to extinction the animals that they, uh, that they depended on, upon for survival. While DNA taken from the Anzic child could not disclose the cause of death or health-related details, it did add significant, significantly to the history of early New World inhabitants. The sample showed a one to two year old male descended from Asian and not European ancestors, supporting the migration theory that pre-Clovis people arrived, via, uh, arrived from Asia, perhaps via the Beringian land bridge, and may have followed the ice-free corridor uh, south through what is now the Rocky Mountain front. And that corridor, corridor runs right through Montana. Fossilized bison antiquous bones from this corridor date to 13,000 years before present, further supporting the theory that the corridor um, provided an avenue for the movement of animals as well as people. The Anzic child's DNA is the oldest recovered in North America and links his ancestry to descendant indigenous American populations. Some believe that the spectacular Anzic site artifacts displayed at the Montana Historical Society in Helena comprise a toolkit of utilitarian implements in various stages of manufacture. Some of the artifacts are new and never used, but some of them were much older and had seen use. In fact, one of them tested positive for camel blood. 
Camelops hesternus extinct camels were among the animals known to roam Montana. So the toolkit includes everything a person would need for survival and serves as a visual how-to manual showing the various tools in different stages of manufacture. Their covering in red ochre mixed with blood, in this case rabbit's blood, is indicative of ritual activity and a practice reaching back thousands and thousands of years. Supplying this child in death with everything needed for survival is evidence of belief in the afterlife. Thousands of years later, some of these customs remain even today. Montana's tribes, like others across the North American plains, most commonly interred their dead above ground. Red, as in the longest, longest ago, continue to symbolize life's transition to death. Red blankets or cloth eventually was substituted for ochre. Even in the dim past, caves and rock ledges may have been the graves uh, of especially prominent individuals, but open air interments, which allowed the spirit to freely travel, were more common and very, very ancient. Open air interments persisted in, in Montana until the 20th century when whites imposed earth burials because of health concerns. The custom, even today, continues very discreetly. These earliest burials reveal practices and beliefs that transcend generations. The desire to place the dead in strategic places carries over to the present desire to locate our cemeteries in beautiful settings or scatter ashes in places that are special to the deceased. From the dawn of time, objects, objects sometimes accompanied the dead as memorials and to assure a smooth transition to the afterlife. Horses, the one uh, there on the right-hand side, as in the Russell painting that you see, uh, and dogs uh, were often killed to accompany the dead in the afterlife. And there's another one there. Consider the thousands of bones of these open-air burials scattered to the winds across the big sky over thousands and thousands of years. The bones of others repose in mountains, across plains, in trees, valleys, and hills, in and beneath our cities, towns, roads, shopping centers. It's just really hard to imagine how many have walked in our footsteps and left pieces of themselves here. And it's poignant to realize that not all of those who were planted here in Montana, like the Anzi child, for example, enjoyed uninterrupted rest. In 1937, Oscar T. Lewis, who was a Glendive rancher and a self-taught archaeologist, discovered a circular um, grass-covered mound on a bluff overlooking the Yellowstone River in Dawson County. It proved to be part of a, of, of a rare 600-year-old earthen village likely established by the early Crow when they split from the Hidatsa and moved west from modern-day North Dakota. The Hagen site, named for the landowner, is a National Historic Landmark and includes the mound, an earthen lodge, and 20 cash pits. The settlement may be the key to a crucial turning point of a people in transition from farmers to bison hunters. The mound, or raised platform, formed a perfectly engineered circle and contained large numbers of human bone fragments, mostly skulls, mandibles, or jaws, and teeth. Dr. William Malloy, who oversaw the excavations, concluded that it was a ceremonial complex, um, including the remains of many different individuals. Some of the mandibles appeared violently separated with stone implements. Historically, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and other Northern Plains tribes interred their dead above, above ground on raised scaffolds, as you see there kind of in the background. While some groups left the dead to return uh, to the elements, others gathered the bones for burial. The Mandan retrieved the bones after the tissue had disintegrated and they separated and bundled the bones and buried the skeletal remains. They then placed the skulls with separated mandibles in a mortuary circle. Now Malloy believed the platform seemed to correspond to this practice. <clears throat> 
But in Montana, the dead were not usually grouped together, but laid to rest singly in remote and isolated places. It was a common belief, as I mentioned before, that open air interment allowed the spirit to travel freely, and that belief persisted for thousands and thousands of years and continues today. One source claims that scaffolds in tree, scaffolding in trees was the most ancient and preferred burial uh, among the upper Missouri tribes here in Montana. If the deceased was male, the face was painted red, the body was wrapped in a blanket, and if the person was prominent, a layer of scarlet cloth completed the shroud. In ages past, painted skins probably served that same purpose. Weapons and personal items uh, needed in the next life uh, accompanied the, the, the deceased, and a tightly laced buffalo robe then encased the entire thing. Sometimes gathered skulls were also placed with the deceased, like you see there. Um, in later time, <clears throat> the body might be enclosed in a wooden coffin. If there were no trees, the burial might be on the ground and loosely covered with stones. Uh, cairn burials might appear as rock piles, but they were placed there intentionally, and cairns should never be disturbed or removed. Sometimes prominent individuals were interred in their lodges, as you see here, and as Christianity spread, some opted for burial in cemeteries, but open air interments remained preferable. Now near the confluence of the Yellowstone River and Alka Alkali Creek, and I may be preaching to the choir here, uh, which once flowed at the base of the bluffs in the center of your modern day buildings, just above the Metro Park, Several places there recall thousands of years of occupation. Hundreds of river crow uh, once, uh, lodges once lay below the rim rocks along Alkali Creek. <clears throat> in 1876, Lieutenant James Bradley noted petroglyphs carved in the face of one of the bluffs slightly west of the present Metro Park. The crow didn't know who did the carving, but they knew the name of the bluff, the place of the skulls. An epidemic, probably smallpox, according to uh, the Indians, swept through the camp. Survivors told how bodies covered the area, horses and dogs ran wild with no humans to care for them, and the few survivors and others later re returned to collect the scattered skulls. They placed them on a shelf that ran along the cliff face about two-thirds of the way up. The place of the skulls is today called Skeleton cliff. Faint surviving art on the cliff face below the place of the skulls depicts a crying round face carved into the rock through a layer of ochre. The image, a combination of petroglyph and pictograph, overlooks the Yellowstone River. The face is unique among rock art in Montana, but similar to at least one example in Washington State. Sagugla Lal, She Who Watches at Horse Thief Lake State Park near the Dallas, dates from about 1700 to 1840. It also com combines pictograph and petroglyph art, is near a burial site, and overlooks the Columbian River. The circles around the eyes may represent the sunken eyes of sick people. The Montana image is likely mortuary art that the Crow or some other tribe adapted from their Western travels. Whatever the origin, the crying image identifies the area as a place where tragic events occurred, and the use of red ochre follows cultural practices from the most distant antiquity. The town of Colson uh, grew in 1877 below the bluffs on the right there in the, in the photo. Dr. William Alonzo Allen, who was a longtime dentist and blacksmith, it's quite a combination if you ask me, um, was working in his Colson blacksmith shop and noticed red streamers that were fluttering over a timbered outcrop across Alkali Creek, just above the place of the skulls. He discovered a tree, a hundred tree interments there. A red Red blanket shrouds had unraveled and possessions of the dead littered the ground. The crying face petroglyph and the stories support the theory that the cemetery resulted from some dire event necessitating multiple interments 
which were highly unusual at that time. Smallpox and dire events like that disrupted cultural practices and resulted in multiple burials in one place. The worst smallpox epidemics occurred in Montana in 1780, mid, the mid-1830s, and 1869 to 70. Now, during the fur trade era, every post had its own cemetery. Time, weather, and shifting river courses and urban encroachment took tolls on many of Montana's earliest white cemeteries at forts and trading posts. At Fort Benton, for example, um, uh, this uh, urban de development, like you can see here, prompted moving the original post cemetery in the later 1860s and uh, uh, sorry, and the later 1860s County Cemetery as well uh, to a different location in the 1880s. Cemetery obliteration or preservation depends upon two major factors, continued relationships of the living with those interred and the need for progress. So Fort Cana was <clears throat> the Hudson's Bay Company post founded near present day Arley in Lake County in 1846. It operated under the Angus McDonald family until 1871. The surviving building that you see there is the oldest standing structure in Montana. The fort's well-preserved small cemetery includes the graves of Angus McDonald and other family members. It's about half a mile from the fort and the small family plots have been maintained by local McDonald descendants and also the Fort Connor Restoration Society. Before the widespread practice of embalming, though, uh, being buried alive and awakening in a coffin was a very common fear, and that remnant shows in this cemetery. I haven't ever seen it anywhere else in Montana. Bells placed above the grave, attached to a string in the hand of the deceased, were popular. Uh, and here, although no string is attached, maybe there was one at one time, I don't know, but the custom does persist, which is, is pretty interesting. Catholic miss missions dot Montana's landscape and some have well-preserved cemeteries, although graves are often unmarked. Conversion to Christianity prompted cultural changes among the native people, including earth burials. St. Ignatius Mission and its cemetery were established in 1854. It's the it was the final resting place for priests, nuns, and First Nation Catholic converts. Uh, the cemetery eventually became full and many of the burials were moved, but there are a few scattered headstones and uh, two square blocks of the old cemetery is where hundreds and perhaps even thousands of, of burials still lie. It remains a sacred place to the St. Ignatius community and it is Montana's oldest existing Catholic cemetery. Once settlers began to add their dead to the soil, early graves were haphazard and most often they were unmarked. There were no tombstone makers in Montana until the late 1870s and even then, the practice didn't immediately catch on. Wood was scarce and tombstones had to be mail ordered at the local mercantile. Such heavy items were very expensive to freight as you can imagine <clears throat> and it took a long, long time for delivery Often people were so transient that they didn't have time to wait uh, months for delivery of a tombstone. As late as 1883, when Helena inventoried its existing half a dozen cemeteries, um, an official stated this, that there was only one fourth of all the graves were marked. And, uh, and, and this is a direct quote. Some of the noblest men and women lie buried, yet their resting places cannot be identified. After considerable inquiry, we do not find that the plot of the lots is kept. The county grave digger keeps no record of interments. He digs a hole, covers a corpse, and the name of the dead is buried in the same oblivion as his body. Documentation of deaths in Montana is problematic until the 20th century. Newspapers didn't always um, publish obituaries, death notices, or causes of death. Epidemics were poorly covered in the press because um, of fear of, of causing panic, and death certificates in Montana were not required until after 1908. 
However, there are some physical reminders of those who died with their boots on, that is, in some violent ma uh, manner, and others who died too soon in Montana's uh, mining camps and boom towns. Mining camp cemeteries with many unmarked graves are easily lost. As residents move on, buildings cr uh, crumble, time passes, landowners develop or cultivate the land or use it for other purposes. Bannock, Nevada City, and Virginia City, however, are fortunate to retain their first burial grounds. Bannock's Boot Hill, north above town on this hill here, may be the state's oldest surviving <coughs> community burial ground. The Bell Tombstone in that cemetery is one of Montana's oldest. Uh, the crude hand-cut stone marks the grave of William H. Bell, who died in 1862 of mountain fever. Difficult accessibility and the desire for a more formal burial ground is likely why the community established a new cemetery around 1880. It doesn't look very new, does it? Montana's sister cities of Nevada and Virginia boomed when gold was discovered in Alder Gulch at 18, in 1863. Nevada City's original cemetery is still in minimal use and has dozens of early unmarked burials. Um, stones like these may mark some of the, of the graves. Virginia City's original Boot Hill Cemetery is preserved thanks to the infamy of the five road agents who were hanged there in January of 1864. The stigma of lying forever in the same cemetery as the accused road agents was repugnant to many, prompting the opening of Hillside Cemetery just across the ridge and the removal of some graves there. Not all those buried on Boot Hill, however, had loved ones to accomplish such a task. William and Clara Dalton, who died in 1863 of typhoid, were among those left to eternally repose on Boot Hill as their four children moved on. While some might believe that no one remains buried on Boot Hill, and I've heard people say that, eyewitness accounts prove otherwise. Years after the hangings in 1907, Lou Calloway described Boot Hill firsthand. He said that there were two lines of undisturbed burials at that time, one line on top of the hill and another slightly downslope to the west. Three stones forming a triangle marked each anonymous grave. Adriel B. Davis, who had been an active vigilante and helped bury the five accused road agents, settled the contro controversy because he knew the order of the burials. He pointed out the grave of George Lane. Exhumation of Lane's congenitally deformed foot confirmed the identity and thus the graves of the others. The foot was removed and the five graves marked with names for the first time. The shellacked foot with sock still attached was on exhibit at the Thompson Hickman uh, Museum until distant relatives claimed it in 2016 under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. The foot was cremated and the ashes scattered over his grave. In the 1920s, the Dalton's grandchildren returned to Virginia City to place the commemorative monument on Boot Hill, not on the actual grave site, which is not known. They, along with Martin Lyon, murdered in, eight, in January of 1865, the five road agents and others who had no family to exhume their loved ones and rebury them, most certainly rest there as well. Unlike most places, Helena had a hangman's tree that served for at least 10 hangings. Some of the known victims were reportedly buried in the city or Catholic cemeteries, but others were more likely buried near the place of execution. Evidence has twice surfaced in what is now a residential neighborhood where the tree cut down in 1875 once stood. One set of remains surfaced in 1900, and a second set of remains surfaced in 1931 when workmen were installing gas lines in the neighborhood. A pair of boots with fancy stitching, like you see on this person, uh, were found on the skeleton, and they matched those in this rare photograph of the hanging of James Daniels in 1866. They are unlike the boots that men usually wore at that time. <clears throat> 
The town of Colson, which I mentioned before, was not a mining camp, but rather it was a river town on the north bank of the Yellowstone that th thrived from 1877 to the mid-1880s. The town was doomed when the Northern Pacific prompted the founding of Billings nearby. But Colson's Boot Hill today sits in a rather unlovely urban setting above Billings' busy main street. It includes an unknown number of graves. Eventually, a, a few markers disappeared, and the site was little more than a pasture. But it was not forgotten. An obelisk marked the site in 1921, and in the 1970s, Boy Scouts added rows of crosses, but not necessarily on the actual graves. Most early graves were unmarked, unless rock with rocks or crudely made wooden headboards or crosses. As communities became more permanent, several early marble works um, opened briefly in the later 1870s and early 1880s, but A.K. Prescott was the very first to establish a long-term monument business, opening marble works in Helena in 1884 and soon after in Butte. By 1890, his company had produced some 3,000 tombstones throughout Montana. His company's signature is found on tombstones in many, many of our communities. The child's chair was a specialty, and there are signed examples in Bozeman, Helena Butte, and Deer Lodge. Physicians in the 19th century uh, in Montana considered an epidemic to be five cases of the same disease. Such ravages knew no social boundaries, and many Montana cemeteries reveal casualties, especially of children. The Silver Camp of Elkhorn has a particularly pathetic legacy. Its remote but well-preserved cemetery, <clears throat> perched high above the town on a wooded slope, graphically tells the story of a diphtheria epidemic in 1889 that claimed almost all of Elkhorn's children. But just as tragic is another story that you don't hear that often. Later that same September, Harry Walton, who was nine, and Albin Nelson, who was 10, had somehow escaped the epidemic. They found a quicksilver container full of black powder that adults detonated for community celebrations, and this one apparently had been overlooked. The powder exploded and blew the boys to bits. They share a common grave because they could not be identified. Beginning uh, circa 1866, Missoula, um, Missoula community's first dead were buried at the base of Mount Jumbo in what is now the Lower Rattlesta Rattlesnake Historic District between present-day Poplar and Cherry Streets. There are no burial records, but the cemetery was in use by the city until about 1884 when the current Missoula City Cemetery opened. The city developed a residential neighborhood on top of the burial ground as shown in a plat map of 1889. Cherry Street homeowners are aware uh, that potential remains uh, lie buried beneath their properties. They are careful where they dig and some homeowners have reported pieces of coffins in the walls of their basements. In 1974, one Cherry Street resident was adding a porch to his house when the backhoe turned up two sets of bones encased in de decayed wood, the decayed wood of two coffins. The bones, along with pieces of metal hardware and splintered wood, were turned over to the University of Montana's anthropology department, where several generations of anthropology students have studied them. Over the years, students have solved some of the mystery, determining that one individual was a child and the other a female adult. Coffin hardware is consistent with 19th century uh, casket styles, but um, whose sleep was so eternally, or was so, um, e whose eternal sleep was so rudely interrupted? So the style of the coffin, which is narrow at the feet and wider at the shoulders, and its silver handles were consistent with the 1870s, 1880s. Student analysis of the adult bones revealed a female between 25 and 34 years old with a poor diet and a porosity of bones indicative of tuberculosis. 
General Land Office records revealed that in 1871 and 1872, Cyrus McQuirk was the landowner of the cemetery. On May 9, 1872, Henrietta McQuirk Harrison, who was visiting her brother Cyrus, died of consumption, the common term for tuberculosis. Scientific analysis of the bones, including testing for tuberculosis, could further strengthen the hypothesis that the adult skeleton was in fact that of Henrietta Harrison. In Helena, St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery on Oaks was in use first from the 1860s and then um, uh, closed in the early 1900s. In the 1970s, the city acquired the long abandoned property and created Robinson Park. A few families relocated their loved ones, but at least 1,065 graves remain undisturbed. Remains have surfaced outside the park boundaries when city, city crews have replaced gas and water mains. In 2004, several caskets came to light, including one child's casket with a viewing window. And likewise, in 2018, more excavating uncovered seven caskets bordering the park. Both times, workers scratched their heads at the grisly discoveries, but all they really had to do was turn around and read the sign that I did when I was at the Historical Society recounting the history of the park. It's really a good idea to research before you dig. So Montana's um, early cemeteries include some interesting ethnic burials, Many Slavic graves at Bear Creek, for example, display, display Cyrillic lettering and contain um, portraits of the deceased. Helena's Jewish home of peace includes family plots gathered around a quaint brick walkway, much like a village neighborhood. And many communities have Chinese sections. This one at Buttes Mount Moriah preserves a rare funerary burner, part of Chinese funerary rit rituals. And a row of Japanese headstones at Hillcrest Cemetery in Deer Lodge speak to the Japanese workers who replaced the Chinese in the 1890s, building the Great Northern Railroad and refurbishing the rail lines uh, into the 1900s. Following the traditions first noted in the Anzic burial, Native Americans and many other cultures too continue to leave familiar or treasured objects with the deceased to aid in their journey in the afterlife. And there are unusual memorials too. For example, Agnes Merrill, a prostitute, um, has pineapples on the posts around her uh, little fence there. Uh, pineapples in the south, of course, are a sign of welcome to visitors. And this sweet little puppy, longing for his master, perches on the edge of a tombstone at Main Cemetery in White Sulphur Springs. Montana's more elaborate cemeteries evolved from models uh, that grew from trends in Europe and in the eastern United States. In the, late 19, uh, in the late 1700s, there was a movement that began in Paris where health concerns over urban burial grounds and the exposure of human remains uh, prompted the creation of Père Lachaise Cemetery in 1804. And it was the first architecturally designed and formally planned Garden Park Cemetery. By the 1830s, the idea had caught on in the United States. Small cemeteries were becoming grossly overcrowded. And where urban burial places were overfull, walls sometimes collapsed. Um, when flooding occurred, sometimes sending generations of burials, one on top of the other, out into the open. Floating coffins and exposed remains, known as bone gumbo in the South, brought well-founded fears of spreading disease. Beginning in the United States in the, 19, or in the 1830s, the rural cemetery movement promoted the image of peacefulness um, surrounded by nature, which was a contrast to previous negative views of cemeteries. Rural cemeteries with landscaped grounds and romanticized monuments served a dual purpose. They alleviated the crowded conditions of small, overfull uh, urban cemeteries that many believed spread diseases. They also provided recreational space, a place to reflect, and a place of history where young people 
could admire the deeds of their ancestors and model their own lives accordingly. At a time when 43% of all children died before the age of five, death was a common family companion. Mothers took their children to the cemetery to allay their fears of death. In Montana, some park-like cemeteries, such as uh, Sunset Hills in Bozeman, were originally planned and evolved, were informally planned and then evolved into places of public enjoyment. By the later 19th and early 20th centuries, Montana's larger cities began to cultivate formerly landscaped cemeteries and artistic sculptured monuments. While cemeteries were usually located in rural settings, partly for aesthetic reasons, in Butte, health and sanitation made it imperative. Mining created ground disturbances in, um, and early urban burials didn't always remain underground. So Mount Moriah was one of Montana's earliest formal burial grounds platted in 1877. It was less an aesthetic function but more of a necessity uh, because there was no landscape, just flat, barren soil. As much as the community wanted beautiful grounds, um, smelting polluted the area and of course nothing would grow. So Butte citizens made up for the lack of landscaping with fanciful and beautiful tombstones. Consequently, Butte has the most unique and attractive cemetery art of any Montana city. Although landscaping was at first far-fetched, by 1905, smelting had centralized in Anaconda and trees and shrubs began to uh, revegetate and today Mount Moriah is beautifully landscaped. Missoula City Cemetery is an early example of the Eastern park-like model. Um, county surveyor and civil engineer Harry V. Wheeler formally platted the grounds in 1885 in block sections with roads to the outside and alleyways for horses and carriages. With the experience gained in Missoula, Harry Wheeler went on to design Helena's Forestdale Cemetery in 1890. Although the 160 acres were bleak and treeless, Wheeler created a natural looking set setting with looping driveways, a small lake with a tiny island, and a grand entry gate. But among Montana's high style cemeteries, the Charles E. Conrad Memorial Cemetery in Kalispell is truly the culmination. It incorporates the use of the natural environment with winding hilly pathways following the natural contour of the landscape and promotes the cemetery as a public park-like retreat. Professionally designed by Arthur Hobart of Minneapolis in 1903, it includes these beautiful great sweeps of lawn uh, with non-intrusive embedded tombstones that you can't really see, which is the memorial park concept that reflects the final phase of cemetery design. Alicia Conrad established the cemetery as a memorial to her husband Charles and saw to the passing of the very first Montana uh, legislation in 1905 that allowed uh, perpetual care for cemeteries. The Conrad family mausoleum is a focal point of a cemetery, but the ferry steps cut deep into the uh, steep cliff below the mausoleum are a Kalispell legend. They once led to a carriage path which gave Alicia private access to mourn her husband. The evolution of Montana cemeteries mirrors the state's development from pre-contact to frontier to fledgling camps and to settled communities. As boot hills and, similar, or, and simple um, pioneer burial grounds gave way to formally planned cemeteries, cemeteries became the last great necessity. Uh, it was a place where the dead could take their final rest, but also where the living could take their leisure. But traditions remain even today, and cultural practices of long ago still sometimes dictate treatment of the dead. In conclusion, it's important to know that human remains should be reported to authorities and left alone. A burial in a remote place doesn't mean that it was intentionally abandoned, rather it most likely was placed there for a reason and deserves the same consideration as a grave in a formally planned cemetery. Many believe that exhumation causes a disruption in the, in the journey of the dead, 
So whether a person lived a thousand years ago or yesterday, the dead deserve respect. While my book, The Life of the Afterlife, um, does trace the history of Montana's burial grounds, it also showcases some institutional cemeteries, like that of the state prison at Deer Lodge, the um, vast neglected cemetery at Warm Springs, some battlegrounds that became burial grounds, and includes some famous funerals, like that of Plenty Coup, for example, and special memorials to those lost in disasters like the Man Gulch Fire, and even memorials to animals like Butte's Auditor, Fort Benton's Shep, and my favorite, Old Pit, an elephant buried in the parking lot of the Beaverhead County Fairgrounds at Dillon. I make no claim that the life of the afterlife that the life of the afterlife is a comprehensive work. And I know there are many, many worthy Montana cemeteries that are not included. But my hope is that this book will spark interest in local cemeteries and foster not only a better appreciation of these places, but also encourage their unknown stories to come to light. So lest we forget those first man Montanans who came to this land, and whose dust lies scattered across our mountains, hills, and plains. A small group gathered on a rainy Saturday morning in 2014. They formed a circle around a sealed box holding the scant remains of the Anzac child. He gave the scientific community incredibly valuable information, but it was time for closure. Tribal elders and scientists came together for his reburial. It was a compromise between the quest for further knowledge and native tradition. The Anzic child's potential to teach future scientists ended, but with closure, all present hoped that his spirit could at last find peace. Thank you. I'd be glad to take questions if anyone has questions. Questions? Comments? Yes. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on ground penetrating radar? <laughs> there was, I read an article where there was a cemetery that's north of Helena on the way between Helena and Berryville. I, I want to say it's Silver Star. Silver City, yes. Or Silver City. Mm -hmm. what, what has happened in the last year, two years, whatever there. Did they actually in, bring in somebody with ground penetrating radar to identify burial spots? Um, I don't know that they did that at that particular cemetery, but they have done that in Helena in, in various places. And um, we have an archaeologist. Where is, where is uh, Steve Auberg? Where did he go? He must oh, have. Yeah. Oh, there he is. I, you're the one that really should speak to that because uh, Steve is an archaeologist and I'm not a technical person. Just, yeah. just the principles of, of, the, of that, maybe. Yeah, I don't know uh, 
and dogs, but we don't want to go there. Really? No. Cadaver dogs, yeah. Oh, okay. What is what capability does an average individual such as myself have with engaging somebody that can actually operate the machine and interpret the result? I mean, how do you go about finding a person to do this? Um, there are uh, uh, there are commercial firms uh, that that offer that service. Uh, I don't know whether the state of Texas Reservation office has some of those firms listed. On that. Oh, you know they they could. Um, I I know of one firm um, in I think they're in uh, Clancy maybe that or Montana City that does that. That's the only firm locally that I know of. But there must be some, you yeah, know. There, 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 there used to be a couple of firms in Missoula. And of course, you can contact University of Montana, uh, uh, the Department of Earth Sciences and Geology. These, these techniques are known as geophysical yeah. techniques. So, uh, but but uh, I know the University of Montana has both GPR and magnetometry. And if you're adventurous and, uh, and want to spend some time, uh, you can actually rent rent the, the equipment yourself, and you can go through. You can either get training from those companies that rent. There's no there's no place in Montana that rents them. In fact, uh, I did that myself on a couple of projects. I rented the equipment, and the only place in the Western United States I found that actually rented them was in San Jose, uh, California, but. Uh, you can, you know, and it's surprising how much you can learn from uh, uh, videos uh, that they provide. Or, in fact, if you go to the um, go to the business, they can they can give you training on that. But uh, it's you not going to buy a unit. Mm-mm. You can rent. I mean, they're relatively expensive. Uh, oh, they are. Okay. They're they're quite expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, but renting them, you know, uh, uh, you can probably rent. Thank you, Steve, for being here to answer that question. <laughs> Anyone else have a question or a comment? Yeah. What does red mean when associated with death? It just means that it is a transition to the afterlife. And, um, you know, that, as I said, that, that color is associated. But, you know, there are other cultures that might use red in a different way. But, uh, but there, are, uh, there are many cultures over thousands and thousands of years that believe that red was the transitory color. And so they would wrap the, the deceased in something red or cover them in red ochre to ease the transition from, the, you know, from life to death. Does that answer your question? Well, just why did they pick red and not the other? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And, you know, other cultures may use other colors, too. Um, I mean, I know that that um, that blue has certain significance, too. But but it's just that over over thousands of years, red seems to be that common thread among various different ages and um, cultures. Sorry, that's about the best I can do. <laughs> I have a second question, yeah. if you permit me. Okay. There is a cemetery that has been, it was, it was first named Sand Coulee Cemetery, then it became Stockton Sand Coulee. But anyway, uh, Stockton still exists, Sand Coulee still exists. It's an early coal mining town uh, near Great Falls, Montana. Mm-hmm. It is a private cemetery, as I understand it. It is open for burial. It is still an active cemetery. My question is, uh, before a person would try to use what the equipment we were just talking about for ground penetrating radar, I'm assuming that you would have to obtain landowner permission 
to do something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, not only this cemetery that I'm specifically talking mm -hmm. about, but any cemetery in Montana. Well, the problem is, is that there are no, there are usually no records as to where people are buried right. in a certain cemetery, and um, you know, unless there is a plot map. Um, it's a dangerous thing to sell plots in a cemetery where you don't know where people are buried because you could be burying someone on top of someone else. And I know that that issue um, has come up in the Silver City Cemetery and that may be why they did ground penetrating radar because some old time families want to be buried there but there's no record of you know, some of the older burials and nobody knows where they were. So that would be a case where ground penetrating radar would really be uh, you know, a, good, a good use to make sure you're not gonna dig somebody up. Is there a sample form or something that a person has to, can use to obtain uh, the cemetery owner's permission? Well, it would depend on you know, whether it's county owned, whether it's privately owned, um, and it would you know, be between you and the cemetery owner. And then it might, you know, there might be other issues too. If it's county owned, uh, you, you would have to go probably through the county in some way. If it's privately owned, I don't know, that may, may be yeah. a different case. Mostly it's, it's if it's owned. privately owned, but I think you would have to make sure that it is privately owned. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are a lot of situations and like that. You know, uh, there are lots and lots of cases like that. Uh, yeah. Well, I want to thank uh, Ellen again for coming down from Helena just to get back over. <laughs> and I just I did want to acknowledge uh, Community 7. Uh, Tim and Lindsay are here. You can see they have all this equipment out. Uh, this went Facebook live stream. And also, in about a week, I think, uh, it'll be on Community 7 TV. And then we also have copies here for the future, as well as the public library. So Ellen is now imprinted in the world of video. <laughs> so it was a great program. Oh, so thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Right. Hope everybody has a wonderful day today. So thanks. We have, we have a book.